Welcome boys and girls. Today we're going to review the PS Audio BHK 600 monoblock amplifiers. I hope you enjoy it. Let's first describe PS Audio and the BHK 600 amplifiers because they're out there and they might surprise you and they might not be what you expect. Those of you who've been around for a while, I mean decades, may think of PS Audio as a solid, high quality manufacturer of mid priced, uh, high end audio. Uh, but in the last I don't know. I'm going to say 10 years. Paul McGowan, who is still running the show, has engineered something of a transformation of the company into a full-fledged, fairly extreme high-end audio brand. And I think this product, the BHK600, is particularly representative of that transformation. So I want to just make you aware of that because... This is an exceptional amplifier. Uh, I'll talk about sound quality in a bit, but let's just go through some of the specs because uh, they're eye-opening. Uh, as I said, they're mono amplifiers, so each one weighs 108 pounds, so they're uh, big and beefy. Uh, nominally, we're talking about an amplifier that's rated at 600 watts into 8 ohms, 1200 watts into 4 ohms and 2000 watts into 2 ohms. That's per channel. And that assumes that you've got sufficient electrical power to actually uh, meet those output specifications. So these are beefy amplifiers simply judged from the perspective of power output. What's interesting is if you read the details of the PS Audio website, I think those numbers are intended to be quite conservative because, and let me just look here and make sure I don't misquote these numbers, the actual rated power on the PS site is 950 watts per channel into 8 ohms and 1500 watts into 4 ohms. Okay, I think that's almost a distraction. Uh, PS Audio does a good job and other manufacturers have done a good job of pointing out that a lot of our listening is done in the, you know, one, two, three watt range. Uh, that's because the low level signals and the, even the average output required to do, uh, music at, let's say, I typically listen at 78 to 80 dB, which is louder than you might think, but not loud. Uh, that those averagey kind of levels uh, don't tell you what you need in terms of power output to reproduce transients. So uh, typically we would say that a symphony orchestra can put out 110 dB peaks. That's if you're just playing symphonic sounds, and I'm not saying that's what you listen to. It's just a reference point for measurements of what can be done with mainly acoustical instruments in large concert halls. That means our average level might be, let's say, 80 dB, and we have 30 decibel peaks. You need a lot of power to reproduce those peaks. If you have relatively inefficient speakers, you're going to need even more power. If you have relatively efficient speakers, maybe not quite so much, but the differences are uh, astounding at what is required to actually produce transient peak, peaks well. And I think what PS Audio has tried to do with this amplifier is say, let's come as close as we can to taking the transient limitations out of the system. Uh, and as I'll tell you in a little bit, that's certainly what I heard. What's interesting about this amplifier is it always sounds relaxed. 
I mean, it sounds very dynamic. Don't get, don't misunderstand, but it doesn't sound like it's trying hard. It sounds like it's reproducing music, and that just doesn't seem to matter what kind of music it is, how transient or poppy or dynamic it is. This amplifier just seems to be able to reproduce that. So I have the feeling that the PS Audio people are kind of onto something. Whether you need this much power or you could use half as much power or a third as much power, I really can't tell you. I want to keep uh, exploring that question, but uh, they've done a very nice thing, I think, which is to kind of take power output out of the equation. But that's not all that's interesting about this amplifier. Another interesting point here is the designer of this amplifier. This amplifier and several of the other PS Audio amplifiers was designed by Bascom H. King. Now, again, if you've been around for a while, you'll probably have heard that name. If you've been around for a really long time like I have, you've definitely heard that name. Bascom designed uh, some Marantz equipment in the late 60s or early 70s. He was then involved with both Infinity Systems. He did almost all the Infinity designs for their Class A power amp and for the servo systems in the uh, speaker systems. Again, go look up Infinity Servo Static or Infinity IRS, and you'll see some of what were the bleeding edge, extreme, state of the art speakers from the 1970s. And Bascom King was around at that point in time. He was also, interestingly enough, he also worked with Jim Bongiorno at Great American Sound on some of the. Ampzilla products and uh, some of the other electronics that gas was involved in producing. And as you may remember, there was a fairly narrow window where uh, Great American Sound was recognized as, you know, pushing the envelope quite a bit. So he was involved with some uh, famous designs over time. He subsequently went on to uh, other manufacturers. He had set up a consulting firm, so he was kind of in the electronics consulting business way before that became a popular way of doing things. Um, he was also a reviewer for Audio Magazine, so he had a chance to listen to a lot of circuits, study the circuits, knowing how uh, preamps and amps worked. He was able to look at the circuit designs and get a lot of knowledge from what people were trying to do with new amplifier circuits and with new devices. In the recent time period, Bascom King was involved in the design of some of the Constellation amplifiers, which, as you will know, we have awarded Editor's Choice Awards to. Um, and his last, I'm sad to say because he passed away when he was 82 years old, his last amplifier design is the one under review today, which is the BHK 600. What, and PS has quite a, a bit of information on their site about the uh, some of the details of the amplifier design, and they have interviews with uh, Bascom on uh, how he went about the amplifier. And I think you see, you know, a uh, typical good engineer, he was very careful about how he thought about circuit topology. And I think this is really an interesting thing. And he knew a tremendous amount about individual devices. A lot of what you're doing when you're doing a power amplifier or preamplifier design is looking at the available components uh, Transistors, this amplifier uses MOSFETs and tubes. This amplifier also uses tubes in the front end. And you're looking at the device characteristics and trying to find devices that are readily available so you can actually be a manufacturing company and that have highly desirable characteristics. 
I'll give you an example of uh, how King applied this knowledge. Uh, I, this is not my area of expertise, but I can tell you just enough about it. Normally in a class AB amplifier, and this is this is a class AB amplifier, it operates class A only up to about one or maybe two watts. In a class AB amplifier, you have, in a transistor amplifier, you have output devices that are of a complementary type. In this case with MOSFETs, you would have uh, N-channel MOSFETs and P-channel MOSFETs. But, and this is something that King observes, this is not original to me at all, King observed that the readily available uh, MOSFET devices were from International Rectifier, and International Rectifier's P-channel, I believe, you can check this out, as I said, on the PS site, but the uh, N-channel devices that International Rectifier makes have a characteristic that makes them not ideal complements to the P-channel devices. Anyway, whichever type of device we're talking about, he decided to use both uh, N-channel devices in the output stage of this amplifier. That takes a special circuit design and some other things he had to compensate for. Uh, so it's not just like a slam dunk, you would always do it. You wouldn't always do it. But he figured out a way around it so that he could optimize around this particular device that uh, where one of the channel types has good characteristics, and he figured out how to make that work. And uh, interestingly enough, using a design that he had discovered in a Yamaha amplifier back in the early 90s. So, you know, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants is how great things happen. And he obviously understood that and practiced that. My point in all that is not to go into the minute details of how the amplifier is designed, but that you it really benefits your work if you have a deep and broad understanding of the devices that are available to you, and then you have a deep and broad understanding of circuit topology so that you can match the circuit topology to the available devices, compensate for their characteristics, and the third thing is you actually really care about listening and your fundamental evaluation is, yes, you start with measurements, but your fundamental evaluation is, does it sound like music? And King obviously went with that approach. And if you watch some of the videos that you can find online with him talking, uh, he might have been an older gentleman, but he was sharp as a tack and clearly was in love with doing amplifier and preamplifier circuit design. Okay, that's all cool. You've got big amplifier, very powerful, and you've got an interesting circuit design that really tries to take each stage in the amplifier and optimize it around currently available state-of-the-art devices. That's also really nice. Uh, PS, because I think you never get that far from your roots, has priced this amplifier at 32500 a pair, which to some of you may sound astronomical, but actually, given the power output and some of the amplifiers it competes with, this is an amplifier that's at, I don't know, it depends on how you look at it, but is at uh, 50 to 70% of the price of competing products, at least as measured by the power classification that we're talking about here. So I hope that's enough of a warm up to have you understand why we were interested in this power amplifier from the beginning. I've spent about six months listening to it. Uh, I wanted to make sure when we're talking about something at this level that I really knew what was going on and that I could identify some of the characteristics or lack of characteristics that are on hand here. And I'll be back in a minute to tell you what I found.
Okay, as we always want to do, let's talk about sound quality. I'm first going to refer to what I said before, which is the dynamic envelope of this amplifier is, in my mind, exceptional. But I want to be sure I'm being clear that you notice it by it not making errors. It doesn't clip or it doesn't crush or it doesn't crunch the sound. And strangely, I said it before, but I want to make sure I get this through, that leads to a more relaxed and natural sound that's just super easy to fall in love with. Okay, now I said before, hey, it depends on your speakers, but uh, a lot of times we're listening at a level of one or two watts when we're cruising along at, you know, regular listening volumes of maybe 78, 80 dB in my particular case. And to my ear, that actually sounds slightly loud. Uh, I have a very quiet room, so that maybe helps a little bit. In any event, when you're cruising along at one watt, if it is correct that in natural, real environments, I'm not talking about super over-amplified environments, but I use a concert hall as a reference because uh, generally symphonies are not uh, amplified. The If we're cruising along at 80 dB, on average, and we want to reproduce 110 dB peak, I believe if we're using one watt to do the 78 or 80 dB, we need something like a thousand watts to reproduce that transient correctly. There are a lot of assumptions in there. Let me not go too far down that rat hole, but you can certainly see that you might want to have on tap, quite a bit of power to make sure that you could handle the dynamic range of music if you listen to a wide variety of music. Now, for sure, there's a lot of pop music that's more compressed. There's a lot of compressed music from way back when, but there's a lot of really well-recorded stuff as well. And uh, yeah, you want those reserves, I think, and I found the way that, that having that reserve on hand came across to be uh, surprising and enjoyable because, as I said, it sounds the sound is more natural. Uh, duh. Okay. Um, I'll give you some examples of some of the music I listen to. This ha these uh, musical groups have uh, different levels of dynamic range and transient behavior, but I want you to know uh, what I put this through. Actually, over the course of listening to this amplifier, I probably listened to 250 or 300 pieces of music, so this is just a somewhat random sample of things that I remember. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of The Absolute Sound. We have a new product, it's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack. First of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks. And now back to the show. On the uh, pop side, uh, Sigur Ross, uh, Wilco, Belmorea, Radiohead, Cindy Blackman Santana, Metric, singer-songwriters like uh, Adele and Taylor Swift and Joni Mitchell and Jennifer Warrens, uh, Jazz artists like Miles, I'll tell you, trumpet. Whew. Trumpet properly reproduced is a thing. Cecil Taylor, uh, wide open, crazy piano. Uh, 
you've got hammers on strings and you get some dynamics there when old Cecil tries to wail on it. Um, and symphonically, since I mentioned the dynamic range of symphonies, uh, I listened to pretty much everything from uh, Beethoven and Brahms through Mahler, Stravinsky, uh, Walton, and uh, some of the moderns like John Adams, who I really like. So it gives you kind of an idea of the bandwidth that I explored. Uh, I enjoyed the sound of the power capability here. I do have to say I don't have the largest room. I don't have the smallest room. I've got speakers. The, I've used MagnaPants with this amplifier. I've used uh, some golden ears. Right now I'm using uh, Magico A5s, which are probably the most efficient speaker I've had in the system at about 88 dB with a nominal one meter measurement. Uh, and yeah, it, it just, it just works. Okay. Enough on big power because that's, that's sort of the like headline thing that's easy to talk about here, but we also want to be able to reproduce musical delicacy. And for me, sound staging is really a huge thing. As I've talked about before, sound staging in particular is significantly a byproduct of having a low noise floor and the the ability of the amplifier to reproduce low level signals with really high fidelity. I won't go into a super lot of detail around that, but if you just think about it, uh, again, it's really easy to wrap your head around how a concert hall works. The same thing is true in a club. The um, the space that you're in is communicated to the microphones and therefore ultimately to your ears by reflected sound captured in the concert hall. As those reflections occur and go around the room, they get lower and lower and lower in level. And as they drop off in level, you've got to be able to capture them and that means that the amplifier has to have a very low noise floor and has to preserve the delicacy and beauty of the low level signals super well. I have not heard sound staging like I heard with this amplifier on previous lesser amplifiers. Now, I will say what you might get with a Solution or a CH Precision or a Constellation amplifier may be of a similar order. It may be even better. Uh, but as you will know, those amplifiers cost two, three, four, five times what these amplifiers cost. And so uh, I was impressed. Let's just leave it at that. There's a third piece I want to talk about with the BHK 600 that uh, I'll be honest with you, I struggled with this on the Audio Research Reference 6SE, and I'm probably going to struggle again, so my apologies, but fair warning. Um, there is a, I believe, characteristic sound of this amplifier that I like, but I'm not sure it's 100% accurate. And that is that, and I've heard this in some other MOSFET amplifiers, there's a purity and a naturalness to the high frequencies. But if I had to at, you know, by requirement, swear where the accuracy level was, I would say the high frequencies 
are 99% transiently accurate, but that the amplifier errs slightly, 1%, that's slightly, slightly on the side of being soft. And my experience is that's the side you want to err on. And since all reproducing devices have errors, you kind of, as an engineer, have to, you know, pick your political party. And I personally think that's a very, very, very minor deviation and one that happens to be desirable because, if anything, it compensates for the less well-designed equipment in the chain, which uh, can get really ugly when it's too sharp, transients are overloaded, or there are other kinds of nasty distortion. It does just, just a little bit of polishing of that stuff, which is why I say I believe it's the side to err on. I've listened over time to a number of MOSFET amplifiers, not of this design, because this has a fairly unusual circuit topology, um, but it's often one of the desirable characteristics of MOSFETs. What's beautiful about the BHK600 is uh, you get very, very little of that MOSFET softness, but it stays on the good side of the ledger. So I found that to be a high re highly desirable characteristic. What are the downsides here? Well, if you can afford these amplifiers, not much. Um, I'll mention a few things that maybe you want to know about. I don't think they would be a big concern. First of all, they're big and heavy. Uh, you have to have the room for these and... Uh, Related to that, they put out a fair amount of heat. Yes, they are not heavily biased into Class A, but they're big, powerful amplifiers, and so at idle, they generate a fairly substantial amount of heat. Uh, you, I would want to run them in an air-conditioned room. I do. Uh, works fine. No problem. It's not quite as much thermal dissipation as you would have with a Class A amplifier, but there's some nonetheless. Uh, they have a tube input circuit. PS does a very nice job of explaining why tubes are desirable for the power supply and why they work well on the input side of the amplifier. They've also done a nifty thing which is there's a power switch on the rear, which is the main power switch for the amplifier. But what they recommend is you leave that main switch on generally, and then you use the power switch on the front of the amplifier to turn off the tube circuitry that's on the input side of the amp. And that lowers your uh, thermal dissipation when the amp isn't being used, and it preserves tube life. So they've given some thought to this, but nonetheless, there are tubes on the input circuit, and at some point those are going to have to be replaced maybe every two years or so. Uh, you know, I don't think that's a huge deal, but it's not, it's not nothing. Um, and while we're talking about all of these thermal properties, not only are they big, but when you have something like this that has this much thermal dissipation, really anything, you just, you can't put this in some tiny little box and shove it in a closet and expect it not to heat the closet and uh, maybe shorten the life of the devices or uh, maybe, maybe worse. So this is not a home theater, put it in a rack kind of product. I Doubt those concerns are really big concerns for most of you, but, you know, there they are. On the plus side, let me mention that the packaging that the product comes in is very nice. 
The box has an interesting feature, which is it's got uh, casters built into the cardboard box and a handle built into it so you can roll it like a rollerboard suitcase. Uh, very heavy rollerboard suitcase, but nonetheless, you can roll it like a rollerboard suitcase. And I thought that was another, wow, these guys have uh, paid attention to the fact that there are real humans using their products. Um, and in addition, I'll say, I think they're very nicely designed. It doesn't look like a mad scientist laboratory experiment. You can see on screen what they look like. You've seen on screen what they look like, but I thought they were clean, modern, uh, and they look extremely well put together. So there you have it. That's the PS Audio BHK 600 monoblock amplifiers. Uh, I hope you can tell I've really enjoyed having them in my reference system. And uh, I think you would enjoy them too, especially if you have speakers that are a little bit on the less efficient side or if you have a relatively large room. I hope you've enjoyed this review. Uh, if you have, please subscribe to the channel. Please click on the notification bell. Please go to the website and sign up for our weekly newsletters. And of course, we would really enjoy it if you subscribe to our magazine, which, as you can see, we've been doing for 50 years now. We love this business, and we want other people to be able to enjoy it, and we'd like to have you along for the ride. Thanks for joining us.